Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Swapnil Joglika. It's the 15th of February 2024 and here are the questions we'll be answering today. Do states have a case against the center on fiscal transfers? How can India reject the PLI scheme? Is there more room for downside in small caps? And what are the key features of bullet train corridors? The tussle between the centre and some opposition rule states over devolution of taxes recently came to fore when Chief Ministers of Kerala and Karnataka openly alleged discrimination. Karnataka leaders even went a step ahead and staged a protest at Delhi's Jantar Mantar after giving full-page advertisements in national dailies, alleging loss of 1.8 trillion rupees. Some are calling it the South Tax Movement. These states have alleged that the centre's policies have shrunk their share of the divisible pool of taxes. So do states have a case against the centre on fiscal transfers? And what will this mean for the 16th Finance Commission? Watch Indiljil Dhasmana and Bashwar Kumar's report to find out. Southern states are protesting against alleged discrimination meted out to them in the devolution of central funds, particularly taxes. And data show that some states, both in the South and elsewhere, do indeed have a case against the center. The tax share of states is decided on the basis of recommendations of the Finance Commission. If one looks at actual devolution of central taxes to the five southern states, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and Kerala, their share came down to 15.8% in the period ranging from 2021-22 to 2024-25, from around 18.6% in 2010-11, which was the starting year of the implementation of the 13th Finance Commission report. This share had remained around 18% till 2019-20. Revances arose among southern states when the terms of reference for the 15th Finance Commission asked it to base the population parameter on the 2011 census instead of the 1971 census that was used by previous commissions. In a sense, there was a change in the base year for population figure, which has a large role in deciding the tax revenue share of states. The southern states argued that they would end up receiving less money from the central tax pool since they had controlled their population better than many other states. To address these concerns, the 15th Finance Commission also gave weight to demographic performance or population control in other words. It gave 15% weightage to the population parameter and 12.5% weightage to demographic performance while recommending the share of each state in central taxes. Based on population from the 2011 census, the 14th Finance Commission had also given weightage to demographic performance at 10% and it gave a weightage of 17.5% for population based on the 1971 census. Before that, population got 25% weightage in the 12th and 13th commissions. In principle, uh, the finance commissions were supposed to follow equalization formula. That means uh, both uh, horizontal equalization as well as vertical equalization. And I think that is the, the purpose of the finance commission if you look at the constitution. Uh, so in that sense, uh, you know, uh, population becomes a major uh, variable for the finance commission. So in between 1971 and 2011, there's so much of change that happened, right? Um, the argument is that uh, the whole that national population control uh, programs uh, seems to have been implemented better in, in southern and western states compared to uh, north and eastern states. So, you know, uh, the argument that uh, these states are giving is that, you know, because you performed well in the population control, uh, you seem to be getting penalized. Now, let's come to the Commission Awards. Here too, the share of southern states in total devolution came down from 17.97% during the 14 Finance Commission report period to a bit over 16% during 2020-21, which was the period of the 15th Finance Commission's first report. The fall was seen both in the recommendations of both bodies and the actual transfer of central taxes. 
The share came down further to 15.8% during the implementation period of the 15th Finance Commission Report's second part. This part will be implemented till 2025-26. The share of each southern state has come down now compared to the 13th Finance Commission period. Meanwhile, cess and surcharges have also been increasing. The collection from it largely goes into centre's kitty. It has increased by 111% between FY18 and FY22. Experts believe that it is being done to bypass the Finance Commission recommendations in the past decade or two. The share of southern states in total taxes hovered around 5.03 to 5.2% most years. However, the share was much lower than what would have accrued to them had there been no cess and surcharge. The divergence has increased in recent times. For instance, the share of southern states in total taxes stood at 5.2% in 2010-11. Going by the 13th Finance Commission report, it should have been 5.94% had there been no cess and surcharge. The share is projected to come down to 5.03% in 2024-25 in the budget estimates. According to the 15th Finance Commission, it should have been 6.48% without cess and surcharge. It is not just southern states that have been affected. Tax devolution to states has been less than what successive finance commissions have recommended at least since the start of the 13th Finance Commission period. During the 13th Finance Commission period, the devolution stood in the range of 27.13 to 28.72% against the recommendation of 32%. The transfer of central taxes to the states was in the range of 32.27 to 36.6% against 42% recommended by the 14th Finance Commission. The devolution was in the range of 29.35 to 33.16% during 2020-21 to 2024-25 against the recommendation of 41% by the 15th Finance Commission. The projected devolution for FY25 will be almost 9 percentage points lower than what the 15th Commission has recommended due to cess and surcharge levied by the centre. Centres, uh, centre also getting into, um, you know, creating a trouble in terms of um, increasing their cess and surcharges. I think the cess and surcharges have become the core of the, uh, you know, uh, tension between the centre and states. According to a report by the Hindustan Times, states such as undivided Bihar, undivided Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal, Odisha and Assam also witnessed a fall in their share of central taxes between the 11th and 15th Finance Commission awards. Note the states which are created after 2000 were clubbed for this comparison because the 11th Finance Commission had made its awards for United Bihar, Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh. At face value, it appears that the southern states in particular may have concerns over the income distance criterion used by finance commissions. To maintain equity among states, the ones with lower per capita income get a higher share of taxes. Basically, it involves taking from richer states and giving to the poorer ones. While the 15th Finance Commission gave it the largest weight at 45% in the overall sharing formula, the 14th had given it a weight of 50%. Ultimately, all of this will make the job of the 16th Finance Commission all the more difficult. Its first meeting was held on Wednesday, 14th of February. It is a problem of redistribution of resources between states, which is a requirement of the Finance Commission. But whether that is sensitive enough to the changes that have been taking place in the dynamic changes, the structural changes that have been taking place in the Indian economy. The issue really is that what happened was you start with a period when you're looking at a state-controlled economy, or then you shift the resources from the states that have more of it to those who have less. But as you move away from a state-controlled economy, uh, you end up with two issues that, that emerge. One is that the you have uh, processes that are beyond the control of the, of the state governments. And you have now taken away even their right for, for, to use taxation as a way to get investments. 
while the workers in the poorer states are themselves in an increasing number taking up assignments in the uh, in the richer states if it was a long term assignment that wouldn't be a problem because then they would be members of the richer states they would be benefiting but these are short term assignments so they are earning in the richer states and spending in the poorer states and in a regime of gst where tax is collected where it is spent in that kind of a regime uh, the poorer states get the benefit of taxation but they are not really contributing to growth they are not really employing their own workers so that is the anomaly that the 16 finance commission has to address there is no immediate solution for the basic complaint of the southern states that they are taxed too much compared to poorer and more populous states but the center can take three specific steps first revisit the borrowing constraints placed on state investment funds second reduce the degree to which it uses cesses and duties and third minimize the discretionary aspect of transfers to states under various developmental schemes Clearly, the center has to strike a delicate balance on tax devolution. Meanwhile, it is trying hard to do a balancing act on another front. Production-linked scheme has been keeping it busy. So far, it has turned out to be a mixed bag. While it has given expected results in some sectors, in others, it is yet to take off. A recent review of the three-year-old scheme threw a contrasting picture. So, how can India rejig the PLI scheme? Shivam Tyagi and Ayush Mishra look for answers. The government's ambitious production-linked scheme, which aims to make India a manufacturing powerhouse, recently came under review by an inter-ministerial panel. It was launched over three years ago in March 2020 and has seen several such periodical reviews. In the recent stock taking the panel found that the scheme was not doing well in some sectors the scheme launched with an outlay of 1.97 trillion rupees helps firms with incentives on incremental sales and production across 14 sectors spanning from mobiles drones telecom textiles automobiles white goods and pharmaceutical drugs among others However, all is not going as planned as firms in certain sectors have shown no interest in enrolling under the scheme. The panel's review report revealed that targeted investment in some key sectors has not been achieved. Investments have struggled to take off in industries such as textiles, information technology, hardware, automobiles and specialty steel. The investments have also been slow in the case of medical devices, ACC batteries and white goods. According to reports, the government had anticipated an investment of rupees forty nine thousand six hundred and eighty two crore in FY twenty twenty four. However, during the initial nine months of this financial year, investments totaling over rupees thirty thousand six hundred and ninety five crore, equivalent to sixty one point eight percent, have been realized across all fourteen sectors. Another issue hurting the PLI scheme is the low pace of incentive processing to companies enrolled under the scheme. In the first 9 months of FY 2024, the total disbursement under the PLI scheme amounted to only 1447 crore rupees across 10 schemes with 78% of this allocation going to mobile devices. However, incentives for pharma, telecom, IT hardware and medical devices among others remain subdued in FY24. What we are expecting from the government now is that there is a provision for overflow wherein if some beneficiary has crossed the upper ceiling and the other beneficiaries have not been able to meet the target then the beneficiary who has surpassed the ceiling is eligible for overflow and incentives so uh, my request to the government is that process needs to be needs to be stated and clarified otherwise the pli scheme is going fine for mobiles for uh, 
telecom devices again we have met the thresholds uh however it's taking time and uh, we have still not received the disbursement or the approvals in telecom pli scheme we request the government to intervene and uh, advise and instruct the implementing agencies to expedite so that the approval process and the disbursement can be more seamless accordingly the government has slashed the disbursement target for the current financial year to rupees 8285 crore from rupees 11000 crore but it is not all gloomy in the pli universe as manufacturing of pharmaceutical drugs electronics and solar pv modules have certainly benefited from the pli but experts say there is still some execution required in the schemes that are doing well for air conditioning components and lighting components again we have met the threshold however the provision in the scheme is that we can apply for the scheme only after the fiscal year has completed uh, which is a very long duration in the case of mobile phones we can apply for the disbursement on a quarterly basis so we have requested the government that uh, in the case of lighting components and also air conditioning components and the operational part should be made similar to what is there in mobile so that the benefits of pli scheme because after all the beneficiaries are making investments and growing their business the fund disbursement can happen timely Industry insiders say that government interventions might help to make the PLI scheme successful in sectors that are lagging so far. So how can the PLI scheme be reached? I feel it has to be sector specific. Um I feel that maybe uh you know already the ministry has done in the past also in in understanding that every sector is very different right uh, you need to create a subject matter experts kind of a committee um in ensuring that is done so maybe i think um, um i would not want to say the word rework but i would want to say uh, how can they partner more with sectors so because every sector is textile would be different a semiconductor would be different electronics would be different and a solar uh, energy sector would be different so i think a more understanding on the sector that is there and and clearly defining uh, the road map is very very important with targets defining so i think that will also further um, not only motivate uh, us the industry but also give clear targets to people going forward As the government ponders over readjustments in the PLI scheme, some industry insiders ask for minor tweaks and better execution in sectors where the PLI has delivered on the desired result, while others seek well-defined targets and even some relaxation in targets for sectors which have seen a subdued interest. However, for now the ball is in the government's court to make PLI attractive for receiving a better response from the industry. A rejig in PLI would indeed help India realize its manufacturing dream. Moving on, market volatility with sharp swings between losses and gains has continued into the current month. While benchmark indices are flat so far in February, it has mostly been a one-way street for small cap stocks that have taken it on their chin with sharp cuts. So, will this downtrend continue going ahead? Puneet Wadwa finds out in this report. Amid ongoing volatility in equity markets, it's a small cap segment that has taken the worst hit so far in February. The Nifty Small Cap 2050 index has shed 3.2% this month as compared to the 1.8% decline in the Nifty Mid Cap 100 and the 0.5% drop in the Nifty 50 index. Technically, the index on Monday slipped below its 20-day moving average or DMA at 14,800 levels. Earlier it had slipped below the 50 DMA in November 2023 before a rebound. Last month too, the index fell below the 20 DMA but bounced back around 9% thereafter. So, will the current downturn in small caps continue? In the short to medium term, VK Vijay Kumar of Geojit Financial Services expects the downtrend to continue given the sharp rally seen in several small cap counters in the last few months. 
the explosive growth in demet accounts and newbies chasing mid and small caps due to recency bias have led to froth in the broader market a correction in this segment is inevitable and desirable vijay kumar says in calendar year 2023 the nifty small cap 2050 index surged 48% as compared to a 44% rise in the nifty mid cap 150 index and a 20% gain in the nifty benchmark that said the nifty small cap 250 index is still trading above its 200 dma of 12066 indicating strength from a longer term A likely recovery thus cannot be ruled out if it continues to hold on to its support levels. For the last two days, the Nifty Small Cap Index is seen testing support around its 50 DMA, which stands at 14,300 levels, below which immediate support for the index is seen at 14,100 level. As long as the Small Cap Index holds this support zone, the index can potentially bounce back to 15,200 in the near term. Analysts however suggest that any potential recovery in the small cap index ahead should still be used to book profits and exit. There's a couple of occasions where uh, both mid cap and small cap slipped below the short term averages. Uh but in no time they have reclaimed the same. And still when it comes to uh, uh you know the broader indices uh, I feel that there could be another attempt but yes uh, the readings are overbought uh, when it comes to The RSI long on the weekly charts is quoting around uh, AD in the range of seventy five to eighty. So this may result in further consolidation and uh, maybe a dip towards let's say fourteen thousand five seventy five eighty. So if uh, we see any recovery this time, uh, the ideal approach for the trader should be to reduce their position. Until we cross uh, and sustain above sixteen thousand two hundred defensively. Thus, given the rich valuations and possible liquidity shortage in the short term, the risk in the small and mid cap segments will remain high. Today, on fifteenth February, the Lal Street will track global markets, while the weekly FNO expiry back home will further guide sentiment. He is making plans for an early retirement. business standard very soon india's financial capital will be connected to ahmedabad with bullet trains railway minister ashwini vaishnav took to platform x to share an animated video explaining the special features of the mumbai ahmedabad train corridor in our explainer segment shivam tyagi tells about the key features of this project Recently Ashwini Vaishnav the Union Minister for Railways Electronics and IT uploaded a video on microblogging platform X that showed the key features of the much awaited bullet train the minister captioned the video as stay tuned for bullet train in Modi 3.0 the bullet train project was announced by Prime Minister Narendra Modi in 2017 with its launch date being in 2023 though later it was advanced by a year to have it coincide with 75 years of Indian independence on August 15 2022 none of these deadlines were met as the project has faced constant delays due to the land acquisition and on ground implementation woes The railway minister has now announced that the first section of India's inaugural bullet train covering a 50 km stretch from Bilimora to Surat in Gujarat is slated for completion by August 2026. On the commencement of operations, Indian Railways aims to run 35 bullet trains conducting approximately 70 daily trips with plans to expand the fleet to 105 trains by 2050. The government expects that around 16 million individuals will utilize the train services annually. Bullet train will operate on a 508 km route connecting Mumbai and Ahmedabad with an anticipated top speed of 320 km per hour resulting in a significant reduction of travel time to just 2 hours. 
द कॉरिडोर विल इनकॉर्पोरेट इनोवेटिव एलिमेंट सच एज स्लैब ट्रैक सिस्टम इन विच द रेल इज अटैच बाई रेजिलियंट फास्टनर्स टू अ कॉन्क्रीट बेस टिपिकली जीरो पॉइंट फाइव मीटर थिक द बेस विल हैव एन एडवांस्ड अर्थ क्वेक डिटेक्शन सिस्टम ट्वेंटी फोर रिवर ब्रिजेस ट्वेंटी एट स्टील ब्रिजेस सेवन माउंटेन टनल्स एंड सेवन किलोमीटर सबसी टनल Additionally, the corridor will feature 12 stations equipped with state-of-the-art amenities. The estimated cost of the project is approximately 1.08 trillion rupees with the central government pledging 10000 crore rupees and Gujarat and Maharashtra committing 5000 crore rupees each. The remaining finances will be secured through a loan from Japan characterized by a minimal interest rate of 0.1%. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. Japan, meanwhile, will celebrate 60 years of bullet trains this October. It was launched between Tokyo and Osaka way back in 1964. Well, that's all for today. For more news, views, and insights, please log into business-standard.com. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.